back. And so we've gone over the theory of what's going to be going on with our X-ray diffraction lab. Hopefully now you watched also the video of, Alex, of me and us, I guess, actually doing the X-ray diffraction lab. So we saw it with um, basically chromium. Uh, but we also did the same kind of procedure with copper polyethylene oxide or polyethylene glycol, a semi-crystalline polymer, again, as we mentioned in our uh, in our lab uh, handout kind of discussion, and PMMA, which is an amorphous polymer. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's do the analysis of this lab. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to extract all extract here. Again, not the most kind of fun procedure, but I just want to make sure everyone knows how to do so. And again, it might be slightly different for your computer. If you're using a Mac, I can't help you, so just give up right now. I'm just, I'm just joking, as always. <laughs> so let's just extract all this data, and let's see what we've got at our disposal. So let's look, for example, let's start with our metals. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to pull these into play. So copper, chromium, and remember, we already have the figures for our lead titanate, um, so we need that discussion as well, but we can kind of put those over here. So I'm just going to kind of arrange polymers on this side, metals like Romeo and Juliet, they can never, they can never mix. <laughs> so as we mentioned in our kind of lab handout, we have three files. One is a text document, which is basically our raw x-ray diffraction data, which we definitely want to po uh, plot and we want to kind of see uh, those values. We also have from our, um, some of the details about uh, kind of the peaks that exist uh, that are, again, our software kind of automatically throws out. So these are kind of the peaks that we observed versus uh, here, on our PDF, which is from our International Crystallographic Structure Database, where it gives you, here are where the kind of theoretical peaks lie in here. So let's go ahead and let's go uh, tackle this one by one. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna pull out my handy, uh, I'm such a nice professor, uh, your X-ray diffraction uh, student analysis Mathematica notebook. So we've decided to find some variables up here, uh, but now I wanna kind of look at and plot my raw data. So I wanna actually Let's go ahead through our exercise here. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's pull out copper. So I want to see the raw data of copper first. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at copper. Paste it in. All right. And just like I kind of show you. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the first like 10 data points. You could probably do 50 as well. Let's do 50. That's what we did last time in our class. So let's do table form. So this is copper. And again, I have my two theta in degrees versus the intensity in counts per second. So those are kind of going to be your axis labels. So I have this like one, two, two rows of kind of junk that I don't want. So I can actually, you could up here go from two to, you know, uh, or three to minus one, or you can kind of just keep this raw data. And then here, what I could do is do CUR copper dat. I'm going to take from three to minus one. And I want to plot this. So let's go ahead and let's, actually, I made this, again, I'm just using our kind of nice and pretty uh, form, and I just want to kind of have people kind of see this. So excellent. Looks like a metal to me. Um, nice kind of, uh, we have these kind of very, very sharp peaks. Uh, everywhere else is, there's kind of flat line. Why is that? Well, because, again, metals have long range translational and orientational order, and they are very, very uh, crystalline. So you're not going to kind of see the wider peaks that are more um, indicative of amorphous structures or semi-crystalline structures. So basically, it's all or nothing, kind of like we, we saw in our um, kind of structure factor discussion as, um, as well uh, in our uh, lab handout uh, discussion. So we want to do, again, several things when we're kind of making these uh, plots. So, uh, and we'll kind of look at these plots. Where do the peaks occur? What does our crystallographic database say in terms of what is our, um, where are the HKL indices that correspond to these interplanar distances for metals? But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. But this is a nice plot. Um, but what would be really nice is to kind of see, like, hey, this is our experimental peak, right? But where are our peaks? Uh, how do they compare to the theoretical value? So this is, again, from our International Crystallographic Database. Um, so these are the theoretical peaks that should be occurring here. So there should be a peak at 43.41. That corresponds to my, uh, let me go ahead and I'm try to annotate here. Hopefully you can see my, uh, this one, uh, number one peak here. This corresponds to this HKL1111 peak. Uh, HKL or indices or inter interplanar distance, so 111. So that peak at 43.41 is corresponding to HKL 111. Uh, for our two theta here, the 90.17, that corresponds to our HKL right here. So let's go ahead and 
kind of tackled this and let's try to kind of overlay uh, these points. So I'm going to bring it over here. I can kind of see I'm going to pull my Mathematic out right here. So I'm going to create this list called Copper Peaks. Uh, Copper Peaks. So 43.41 and then I'm going to also do there's one at 90. 90.17, oops, excuse me, oops, 90.17, there's also a peak, let's go down below, there's a couple peaks up here, at, here we go, the order doesn't really matter too much, 0 0.5, 50.56, 70, and you see why in a second, 70.30, and let's go ahead and look on the other side, 95.40. So these are the theoretical peaks. So we can do that. And then I added this additional kind of cool function, grid lines, copper peaks. So it's going to create vertical red lines, red dash lines to show the theoretical peaks. And we can see in this plot here uh, that we have pretty good agreement. Look at it. It kind of matches up everything. Uh, for copper, for this last peak here that you might see, uh, you don't see kind of a clear peak because Copper is a really, really hard one to deal with. It kind of always falls off the edge of our grid. Uh, so that's kind of one thing to uh, kind of consider and think about. So when we are going through, and, and you know, so we now we see kind of these peaks occur, right, at different HKL indices. So for copper, what type of material is copper? Well, it is a, let's go to our fancy handy lab handout here. Once again, let's look at our kind of structure factor equations. So I know that copper is an FCC material. So I should have done uh, <laughs> I should have done uh, chromium instead. So I know that copper is an FCC material. So I have there's my I'm kind of switching up, switching up here. I have copper. Copper is FCC, meaning it has four atoms. So I can uh, basically choose my basis as I'm going to have an atom at Zero. We have again FCC. We have atoms like here, here, two, and then at the corners here are the each of the faces as well. Face, face, face atoms everywhere. You kind of get the picture. So I'm going to choose. I need four atoms as my basis. One, two, three, and four. So I'm going to have an atom at zero, zero, zero. I'm going to have an atom at again. These should be you know, basically these are. Uh, coordinates, not uh, planes, <laughs> so that people, again, they're not directions either, so uh, again, give me some leniency here. So I'm going to have a, an atom at zero, zero, zero. I'm going to have an atom at half, a half, uh, zero. I'm going to have an atom at, uh, basically, an atom at zero, one half, a half. And I'm also going to have an atom at uh, one half, zero, one half. So these are my four atoms. These are again, uh, looking back through those selection rules up here, uh, we are going to plug in these, uh, all of those X, Y, Z kind of coordinates uh, that are going to be taken there. So let's go ahead and see what happens to here if we plug in those values. So, so if I do F of my HKL, my selection rules, HKL equals, they're all F of my copper atoms. Thankfully, uh, there's other structures where you can get these um, kind of hybrid like zinc blend and other kind of um, uh, other structures. So that little f, this kind of structure factor equation will be different as we kind of talked about again uh, in our you know other lecture. So that can definitely be uh, different for different if you have, you know, for example, um, brass or just copper zinc. But that's a discussion in an XRD lab for another day in a higher level course. So let's go ahead and write this out. So uh, copper. So E to the minus two pi i times zero, because zero, 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 where, where do you go there? Plus, because uh, we're doing again the sum, e to the minus pi i, pi i times, basically we'll do uh, of h, h plus k, plus e to the minus pi i of h plus l, and plus e to the minus pi i. I'm just doing some math here. k plus l. So those are, again, my four values. So I already know that e to the minus 2 pi i, what is e to the 0? So this is going to be already uh, 1. 
So we're good and we're fine there. So now the question is the rest of these values. When do they uh, kind of cancel out each other? And when, do we're, we're, when are we going to see a peak uh, in the structure factors? What are our conditions on H, K, and L? So when are they going to, uh, when are we going to see essentially um, some value? Well, let's kind of consider here. What happens if uh, H and L, let's say, let's kind of play, uh, play around with some of these ideas and these, some of these conditions where we're going to see some values. So let's say that H, uh, K, and L are all odd. So let's say that this is 1, 1, 1 plane, for example. So let's see what happens. So this is going to be minus pi i, minus 2 pi i. And again, that's the kind of go back in here for just a second. Oops. Let me go in here. Ah, Google Drive. What happens to exponential minus 2 pi i? 1, what about if it's odd, minus 1. So just a kind of a reminder from that. <laughs> so if h, k, and l are all odd, so let's see what happens here. So these all become positive, right? So we're going to see a signal, and that signal is going to be this 4fcu. Again, the intensity will be the magnitude of the squared. If I want to get intensity. So if h, k, and l are all odd, I am going to see a signal. What happens if they are all even, for example, 2, 2, 2? All right, well, let's see what happens. Uh, if they're all 2, 2, 2, I also see a signal. So that's good. All odd or all even. So that'll work. So what if they are mixed? So let's say I have my HKL is 1, 3, uh, 1, 3, and 2. So let's see what, how this happens. So H plus K here, that would be even. So that works. H plus L, that would be odd. That's no good. And then K plus L, that would also be odd. So that's no uh, good at all. So we see here that our condition, so different from we're going to BCC, what do we kind of see? We need to have H plus K plus L, you know, so we need to have H, K, and L all odd or all even, and we'll see a signal. If they're mixed, no signal. Beep. We're gone. So let's see, looking at our international structure database, flip my computer, let's see if that matches. So 111, all odd. What about here? All odd here. What about here? All even, all even, all even. Seems to match. So you're going to want to, in Mathematica or in PowerPoint, you want to label each of these kind of peaks here with their corresponding HKL indices. But that's how you can kind of determine the selection rule, too. All right, so one of the other things that we want to kind of determine in this lab, again, based on our lab handout, uh, which we'll kind of see here, we want to kind of measure some of these parameters. So for the first peak uh, that we see, we want to measure these uh, kind of uh, our interplanar distance, our D, we want our structure factor A. Luckily, again, these are all cubic materials that we're dealing with, so uh, we are just going to be dealing with kind of this equation here. And again, I've been kind of kind enough to uh, kind of draw the equations in here. So we're just going to look at our first peak. So our first peak that we see here, there's the, kind of like that false peak in the first part. So but that first two theta peak that corresponds to what we see is this 43.47. My theta is equal to 43.47. My lambda, I can just get rid of that because I already have it. My HKL indices for that first peak are 111. So HKL are 111. Uh, my D, let's go ahead and figure that out. And then B as well. So let's solve for these uh, values. And B, remember, actually, we could actually solve for, excuse me, B or D will define later, but B we could have as well. So B is that full width at half maximum value, right? So looking back again at our, uh, our very extensive lab handout, we could see that our full width at half maximum equation here is right here. And again, that's luckily included right in our kind of handy spit out from our experimental apparatus. So Full width at half maximum is 0.2185. So I'm going to go through here. Equals B is equal to 0.2185. So now I can solve for everything else. So my D is now this. So D is equal to here. And this is all in angstroms because, again, we use SI units. 
Uh, again, how many of these can you really trust? I'd trust to two decimal places. Everything else is probably definitely an error. Um, now I could solve for D for A. Here's my A value right here. And I have my T function to uh, solve for the crystallite size. And again, you see that the two theta divided by two, because again, we're reading out uh, the two theta value. We want to divide it by two because that's been our expression that we kind of talked about last time for the sure formula. So this is again, your crystallite size. So it's basically the size of the crystal in your system. Um, so again, most, most materials are not single crystal, they're polycrystalline materials. So this is your crystallite size, which is about, again, uh, 3.91 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. Excellent. So you're going to do this exact same thing for chromium next. So selection rules, plotting, uh, calculating these values, all those should be expected on your kind of lab report. Now, what else uh, kind of are we expected to uh, look at? Well, we also want to examine uh, polyethylene oxide. So that is a polymeric material. So let's go ahead and let's pull up. If, I, if you look at your polymers, they don't have um, kind of this XRD crystallographic database. Why is that? Well, because polymers are never 100% purely crystalline. They are uh, semi-crystalline materials. Um, so they'll be partially crystalline, partially uh, amorphous. And we could actually distinguish that. Let's look, take a look at our polymer. So let's look at PEOR DAP. Let's look at the polymer. How does this compare to our metals? Much wider peaks, right? So again, just like we were talking about in class with our uh, basically RDFs and PDFs, wider peaks correspond to what? Again, less long range order, more of a more short range order type material. The, you know, there's basically some noise in here uh, in your kind of structure. So not everything is perfectly, again, there's not this long range translational order. There's some kind of, not randomness, but the atoms aren't at that specific distance. So you see the peaks kind of widen. You don't, you have a kind of a wider signal because again, there's some array or range of distances. So they're not exactly 1.5 angstroms apart. It could be 1.55, 1.56. So that causes this width to occur. And now, polyethylene oxide is a semi-crystalline material. So what do you think that, well, what do you think will happen if I do this comparing to the amorphous material? So. PMMA, let's see if I can get this right. You shouldn't be playing like this and doubling down your variables. Ooh, worked. I have a good memory. Look at this. A single peak, much wider peak. Again, you want to make these comparisons in your lab report. So uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, so write these up. Great. You know, look at the kind of uh, example that's given on Canvas. Uh, watch the videos. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, X-ray diffraction is not an easy topic, but hopefully it's been a fun one and kind of elucidates look at the difference between metals, polymers, semi-crystalline polymers versus, sem uh, versus amorphous polymers. And again, you had that lead titanate um, kind of case study for you to kind of examine as well. So why does lead titanate have a negative thermal expansion coefficient? Um, looking at these kind of values, where is the, you know, uh, where is the cubic to tetragonal transition? Where does it occur in terms of temperature? Why is the material shrinking? What's the kind of, uh, what is the kind of key takeaway from that? Uh, so make sure to write about that. And you know, we didn't do that in class um, because it's way too much work, but um, write about this. And again, remember, structure dictates properties. Uh, you write that a million times in your lab report, you'll be just fine. So please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see everyone in lab this week. Thanks. Bye.